Well, now that October is pretty much here, you're going to be hearing a whole lot more about the International Conference on Missions because we're less than two months away. We're basically getting close to being only a month and a half away uh, from when that event is taking place. So, so you'll be hearing... Besides hearing that, you will be hearing lots of information you know, regarding the conference as we get closer and closer. Okay, today, let's talk about the book, okay? That's what it's going to be about. We're just going to talk about the book, and it's not, for those of you that come regularly, you know, that's not really unusual, because we talk about what's in this book every Sunday, every time that we get together. But today, today I want us to talk about it in a broader sense than maybe what we normally do. Actually covering more territory than what we normally do. If you've spent much of any time at all in the Bible, you know that the overall message of the Bible comes through loud and clear from Genesis to Revelation, and that overall message of the Bible can be summarized in three words. And these are the words. God loves you. And, and from start to finish, this is what's being conveyed in the Bible. You see, the storyline of the Bible, you know, Genesis to Revelation, the storyline of the Bible is that God is the creator of all things. And that he made us in his own image with the intent of sharing in a special relationship with us that we might know him, but a problem surfaced. And that problem was called sin. It entered into the equation, not on God's part, but on our part. We rebelled against God, thus severing the relationship that he made possible. As a result, separation, pain, and death entered into the mix, and man was incapable better said, man was powerless to do anything about that. So God, motivated by love, set into motion a plan to do something incredible. Not only did God create a way for us to become aware of our dire condition, but God did the unthinkable, the unimaginable in the person of Jesus Christ. He stepped out of the realm of glory and he stepped into our realm. God became a man. He became a man in order to help us to know the heart of God better, but it was more than that. He became a man ultimately for the purpose of paying the penalty for our sin. And that's why the cross happened. It wasn't a matter, the cross wasn't a matter of, of our Lord being in the wrong place at the the wrong time he was exactly where he knew he needed to be on the cross he paid the price to set us free from our sin and on the third day he rose from the dead to seal the victory what we were powerless to do ourselves he did for us through the greatest sacrifice that this world has ever seen or for that matter that this world will ever see what happened on the cross enables us to be forgiven of our sin. What happens on the cross enables us to be restored to a relationship of good standing with our God. A relationship to be enjoyed in this life, but it's also a relationship that will bridge the gap from this life to the next, stretching into all of eternity. You see, that, friends, is the story of God's love. For you. That is the storyline of the Bible. So however long that took, two to three minutes, maybe tops, I just summarized the entire message of the Bible. And to summarize it even further in three words, God loves you. That's what it's all about. But today, for reasons that I'll explain later, I'm not going to talk about the storyline of the Bible. 
But rather instead, I want to talk about some of the other stories that are embedded in the pages of the Bible. Let's call them, let's call them mini stories. Mini stories that are a part of the greater story of what the Bible contains. There, there are many stories scattered throughout the entire Bible that serve to breathe life and hope into our lives. These are the kind of stories that every time you happen upon them, they give you somewhat of an added, added boost. They put a skip back in your step again. They help pick your chin up when circumstances in your life has caused you to look down. They give you insight and inspiration that's needed in the middle of life's ups and downs that we encounter. You see, it's these mini stories that we're going to be focusing our attention on today. These mini stories that really help us to appreciate some of the words of the psalmist that are recorded in Psalm 119, 103, where it says, How sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. In fact, that's the memory verse for this week. That's on your outline. You can check it off on your connection card that you're going you're gonna to memorize this passage. There's another psalm, Psalm 19, referring as well to God's words, and it says it like this. They are worth more than gold, even the purest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even the finest honey. Last Sunday, on your connection card, I had a survey question that was worded like this. All three services, people had an opportunity to write in their answers. We got a good number of responses. Here's what the question was. What is one story in the Bible that gives you a shot in the arm? An extra dose of hope. And there, there were several people, there were six or seven or eight people or so, that basically their answer was the storyline, the big story of the Bible. And that really wasn't what I was fishing for. I was fishing for these mini stories that are embedded within the big story. And there were lots of responses that were given. And so basically what I want to do today is, is I want to summarize for you four of the responses that, that were given on the connection card last week, and then I want to add two of my own onto the list. And so we've got to be careful because of time, because every one of these represents a message in and of itself. So we got some territory to cover here. But uh, let's talk about some of your responses that were on the connection card last week. These are Bible stories that breathe life into your lives. One of the responses that was given, in fact, I think a couple people wrote this down, was a reference to the fiery furnace. And as I have it listed on your outline, that comes from Daniel chapter 3. And you might recall some of the details of this particular mini-story within the greater story of the Bible. This is during a time that the Israelites were in bondage in Babylon. So they weren't even in the land of Israel, the land that flowed with milk and honey. They weren't there now. They had been taken away into to Babylon, into captivity. And the king of Babylon was this guy with a big 50-cent name, Nebuchadnezzar. And what we read in Daniel chapter 3 is that Nebuchadnezzar, he did something which really wasn't that unheard of in some of the pagan nations back in those days. He built an idol, except this was an idol that was second to none. This was a 90-foot idol made of gold, made in his own likeness. And so he sent a message out throughout the entire kingdom inviting basically demanding that everyone who was anyone was to come to the capital city for the dedication of this 90-foot statue. And so there were people throughout the, the empire, throughout any, any rank in, in the government of the empire and any other you know, significant citizens in the empire that all converged on the capital city for the dedication of this huge idol. And the instructions that were given was that as soon as the music starts to play, you are to bow down, fall to your knees, and bow down to this 90-foot statue. Many of you are ahead of me because you know exactly what ends up transpiring. As soon as the music started playing, everybody, the sea of people, they fell to their knees, with the exception of three men, three young men, by the names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They did not fall to their knees. 
word got back to Nebuchadnezzar that there were three guys who aren't cooperating with this, so he had them brought to him. And he gave them a second chance, said, all right, guys, maybe you didn't understand. I know you're not natives of this land, so let me re-explain it again and give you a second chance. But that's when they, they explained to him, they said, no matter how many chances you give us, we're not going to bow the knee to this statue because our God is the living God. And he is able to deliver us from your hands. But even if he doesn't deliver us from your hands, we will not bow the knee. That infuriated Nebuchadnezzar. He already had a means by which to punish whoever defied his orders, and it was this fiery furnace. But now he was infuriated so much that he gave orders to heat it up hotter than normal. And they bound up these three guys to throw them into the fiery furnace. In fact, even, even the soldiers who, who were doing the throwing into the fiery furnace, they even died because they got so close to the entrance of the furnace, and it was so hot. But shortly after, these three young Hebrew men were thrown into the furnace. Nebuchadnezzar stood up, and he took a look into the flames, and he had a question and it's recorded for us in chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm. He said to his advisors, Didn't we throw three men bound into the fire? Yes, of course, your majesty, they replied to the king. He exclaimed, Look, I see four men, not tied, walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar is just blown away. He gave instructions for the guys to come out of the fire. And when they came out, we read the rest of the account that says that not even a hair on their head or their clothing was singed or even smelled like smoke. And Nebuchadnezzar, he just it, it, he became convinced that indeed the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the God. And so he gave a decree that applied to everybody gathered on that occasion, but also applied to the far reaches of the kingdom. And it basically said anyone who says anything against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's God, their house will be turned into a pile of rubble and they'll be torn limb for limb. Man, what a conversion. But you know, as I read that particular story, and I think whoever, a couple people that mark that down, I think there's a very loud and clear message. What is that message that's in that story? The message is this. God doesn't abandon us when all hope seems lost. He does not abandon us when the outlook looks bleak. He will not leave us. He'll stick with us through the thick of it, just like he stayed with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And that's why when Nebuchadnezzar looked into those flames, he saw four figures instead of just three because God had not left them. Another person put down on their connection card last week uh, made reference to the story of Esther. The story of Esther is 10 chapters long. Actually, it's probably more accurately to be described as nine and a half chapters long because the 10th chapter is so short. But Esther, it's, it's really a unique book in the Old Testament. Um, first of all, one of the things you notice as you're reading through Esther is that timing is everything. I mean, the timing of the different events. If there was only one or two particular incidences that were being highlighted in the book of Esther, it would be fairly easy to walk away drawing a conclusion that it was just a coincidence. But the fact of the matter is, every chapter you're reading, you see timing and timing. I mean, it was just perfect the way everything was working out. The distinction of the book of Esther is that the name of God is not mentioned anywhere in the book in all 10 chapters. But the reason it makes it into Scripture is that the fingerprints of God are all over the place. I mean, every, every time you turn the page and you're reading in Esther, you see that God is at work. My favorite part, and there's a, a lot of parts that make up the story, but my favorite part is in chapter 6, verse 1 kind of introduces it. It says this, that night the king could not sleep. 
So he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. Now, again, this is not in Israel. This is in a foreign kingdom, okay? And, and you know, earlier, Esther, she had won a beauty contest. She became the queen. And, you know, there were other things like Mordecai, her older cousin, you know, he happened to be in the right place to overhear a plot to take the king's life, and he reported that, saving the king's life. And, I mean, there were just several, several events that were playing out. And then, then there was this fella introduced into the storyline that was a wicked man. His, his name was Haman. And Haman was, was rising in the ranks of the people. And, in fact, he became second in command under Nebuchadnezzar under the king himself, not Nebuchadnezzar, but under the king himself. He, he became second in command. He was now a high-ranking official with lots of authority. And it was going to his head. He absolutely despised the Jewish people. He didn't like them. In fact, he's the one who initiated this new law, and he got it passed, a law that picked a date on the calendar that made it legal for anyone who wanted to, to kill a Jewish person. You could kill them and that it would not be considered a crime on this one particular day. And it was a law that was made that could not be revoked. And Haman also hated Mordecai. Because made, uh, Mordecai, I mean, that was part of the reason he hated the Jews so much is that Mordecai just never paid him respect, though he didn't deserve it. He demanded it from people, but Mordecai wouldn't give it to him. And so Haman was just, he was so excited because he had been promoted in the kingdom, but yet he was still so deflated because Mordecai was still alive. And he was bound and determined to put an end to that. And so, so one night he's making these plans and he gives instruction to his family and some others to build these gallows in which they're going to hang Mordecai the next day as soon as he gets the approval of the king. So that's the plan that is set into motion. And then it's that night the king couldn't sleep. He laid there on his bed, restless, turning and turning. Now, it'd be very easy for a person that's having a hard time sleeping to, to you know, think, well, okay, well, it's just I shouldn't have had that caffeine drink that I had, you know, this late in the day, or I shouldn't have eaten what I had eaten. It's not agreeing with me. Or this stinking bed, it is so uncomfortable why didn't I get a sleep number bed? You know, I mean, there's all these, these things that could have been going through his mind as to the reasons why he wasn't able to get to sleep that night. But in reality, we know why the king wasn't able to get to sleep, and it's because God did not want him to sleep that night. And so what the king did was, instead of counting sheep, I mean, he was king. He didn't have to count sheep. He had one of his attendants go and get the record of his reign and start reading that to him. There's nothing like hearing your life story to put you to sleep, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's basically what was happening. And so someone is basically reading the king's life story to him, and he's still not able to sleep. And they come upon that chapter that explained how Mordecai had un covered a plot against the king's life at some earlier point in time. And the king interrupted the guy who was reading and said, hey, by the way, what did we ever do for that Mordecai guy to reward him? And they said, we didn't do anything for him. And the king's like, oh, come on, man, we got to do something for him. He saved my life. And by now, it's the wee hours of the morning. And so the king says, well, Look out in the courtyard. Who's out in the courtyard right now? And so the attendant goes and looks out in the courtyard. And guess who's gotten an early start on the day? It's the wicked man, Haman. Because he wants to be first in line to present his request to the king. I want to hang Mordecai until he dies. And, and so, so the servant says, oh, it's Haman. And the king says, well, bring him on in here. And before Haman has a chance to say a word, the king says, Haman, I got a question for you. What should be done for the man the king wants to honor above everyone else? I mean, how can I publicly show 
how appreciative I am and, and how much I'm honoring this person. Now, Haman, with his big head, is standing there thinking, well, who else could he want to honor other than me? And so he comes up with this elaborate thing like, well, take one of the king's own horses that only the king has ridden and put this man on the on that horse and let one of the most important officials in the kingdom lead the horse through town and shout out this is what the king will do to those he wants to honor and the king's like man what a great plan let's do it Haman go get one of my horses and get Mordecai to get on top of the horse and take him through the streets of the capital city Haman just his head just deflates and he's just down the dumps and, and he goes and he does that and it's not too long after that his plan to kill Mordecai becomes apparent and his plan regarding all the Jewish people and all of this and guess who ends up hanging in the gallows that had been built outside of his home it's not Mordecai it's the wicked man Haman what is the message that we see in the story of Esther. The message that I walk away with is this. Don't underestimate the providence of God. To say it another way, God's in the details. You may feel like God is such a big God that he's really not concerned about the details going on in my life. You couldn't be further from the truth. God's in the details of your life, in the circumstances, in the things that are happening. And that's what comes through loud and clear in the story of Esther. Let's talk about another answer you guys gave on the connection card last week. Elisha's servant allowed to see. Now, those weren't the exact words that a couple of you used, but, but this is what you're talking about. Elisha's servant that had his eyes open spiritually and he was allowed to see. This is record, recorded, as I put on your outline, in 2 Kings chapter 6. What the situation was at this time is that the king of, of Aram, he was at war with Israel. And so he had all these battle strategies and he was maneuvering his troops and all this stuff. But it seemed like the king of Israel was always one step ahead of him, anticipating every move that he was making. And finally, the king of Aram, in frustration, started accusing the people closest to him and said, we have an informant in our midst, some spy that's relaying everything I'm saying to the king of Israel. And one of the guys standing there said, no, we don't. Your king, your, 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 your highness, your, your honor. We, we don't have an informant here. Rather, instead, it is the prophet Elisha. The prophet Elisha is telling the king of Israel your battle strategy. He's telling what you say. Even in the privacy of your own bedroom, the, the prophet Elisha is relaying the words to the king of Israel. And so the king of Aram, he decides... Well, enough of that. We need to get Elisha. He determines where his, the prophet's whereabouts are, and he dispatches not a troop, not a group, but rather instead, the Scripture specifically says, he dispatches a massive army to go and get Elisha. He don't want to take any chances. He wants to snuff this out for good. And so he, he dispatches, dispatches this massive army that goes to where Elisha and his servant are spending the night. And in the watches of the night, the wee hours of the night, they surround the place. And so it's early in the morning when Elisha's servant gets up to stretch his legs and he takes a look and he sees the, the Aramean army that is all over the place surrounding. And he's, he's now scared. He, he wakes up the prophet and he says, what are we going to do? There are so many of them. And Elisha says this in verse 16 of that chapter. Elisha said, don't be afraid, for those who are with us outnumber those who are with them. And it's at that time Elisha prays that God will open the eyes of his servant so that his servant can see what he sees. And sure enough, Elisha's servant's eyes open, and he is able to see not just the, the, 
the Aramean army that's all over the place. But now he's able to see countless horses and chariots of flaming fire. His eyes have been opened to the spiritual realm. And now he sees why his prophet, the prophet Elisha, was so calm. Because now he sees we're not outnumbered after all. God's in control of the situation. What is the message that comes through loud and clear here? The message is, with God on your side, you're never truly outnumbered. You're never truly outnumbered. When you stand for God and when you live for God, you are never outnumbered. There's another story that, one of the many stories within the greater story of the Bible. The thief on the cross. Perhaps this is the one we're most familiar with. This was on that final day of Jesus' earthly life, the day of his crucifixion. In fact, the story picks up with Jesus crucified, still alive, but he's hanging there on the cross. And along with him are two thieves. And one of those thieves, in the dying moments of his life, now whether it's only minutes away from when he dies or hours away, I don't know for sure, but, but uh, you know, he's going to die before too much more time passes and in those closing moments of his life he has a spiritual awakening his eyes are open we don't know the details of his life other than the fact that he was a grown man and that he had lived outside the law and now he was receiving his just due and while he was hanging there on the cross he calls upon the grace of god and he says to jesus lord would you remember me when you come in your kingdom and Jesus responded by saying, truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. He calls upon the grace of God and he receives it. He receives the grace of God. What's the message that comes through in this mini story of the thief on the cross? Well, here's the message that I walk away with. It's never too late to turn your life over to the Lord. It's never too late. I've lost track of the number of times over the years that I've had people that are middle-aged people and older who have finally, for whatever reason, gotten that wake-up call and they finally started to live their life the way God was wanting them to live it. They began to pursue for the first time in their life a relationship with the Lord. And they may have been 60 years old, but, but this was the very first time that they're actually getting with it spiritually. And, and in, in, in one sense, you know, when you're talking with someone like that and you see that kind of a decision making, you see the enthusiasm and the excitement that they're experiencing. But at the same time, you feel their pain and their grief, their sadness. And oftentimes they'll express it. Why did I wait so long? I wasted so much of my life. I could have been doing this 40 years ago. But instead, I was living for myself all this time. And the thing I always try to reassure people with when, when I see that they're struggling with thoughts like that is there's nothing we can do about the past. We can't go back and relive the past, but from this day moving forward, we can do what's right, and we can live for God. And the fact of the matter is this, this thief on the cross, he had lived out 99% of his life, actually 99 point something, percent of his life without God being a part of the equation but he made the right decision and he turned his life over to the Lord and the grace of God made up for the rest yeah there's all kinds of mini stories within the greater story of the storyline of the Bible those were some of the ones that you all put on the connection card last week let me add a couple and perhaps elaborate just a little more on each of these 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 are a couple that i would add to the list bible stories that breathe life into my life one of them is rahab actually had someone in the 745 service that walked out and, and she hasn't been going to church a real long time she goes i had never heard the name rahab i didn't even know there was a story about a rahab in the bible you know, and it, she was just talking about how much this blessed her. Well, over the years, this story has been a blessing to me as well. 
The majority of the time that Rahab is referred to in the Bible, the word prostitute is added right next to her name. And we're only talking maybe eight times that she is directly referenced by name. And at least five of those times, maybe six of those times, uh, it, it, it uh, is in addition to the word prostitute. She was a woman with a tarnished past. She carried on her trade in the city of Jericho. Honestly, we don't know a great deal about Rahab. We know that her, her house was built into the wall of the city. We know that she had family members there inside the city. And we know that she was a prostitute, that she traded sex for money. Those are the things we do know about her. And then came about this encounter with two Hebrew spies. Joshua was ready to invade the promised land. Moses has just passed away, but before they, before they get after it, they send these two spies into Jericho to check things out. And they go into the city, and someone spots them and reports to, to the king of Jericho that there are spies here. The spies, they find out about Rahab, and they go to Rahab for some reason for hiding. And she hides them. And it's real interesting here to, to hear her words. And so I'm going to read for you about four or five verses. This is from Joshua chapter 2, starting in verse 8. And these are the words of Rahab. And it gives us a lot of insight into what's happening with her. It says this, starting in verse 8. Before the men fell asleep, they were up on the roof hiding and eventually would fall asleep. Before the men fell asleep, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and everyone who lives in the land is panicking because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings, you completely destroyed across the Jordan. When we heard this, we lost heart and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. There's something very telling there in what she said, and it's especially that part in verse 11. She says, after summarizing, this is what we've heard, and then she says, for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. It's her profession of faith based on the accounts that she had heard, it had caused her to come to a point of faith. And so she makes this confession, a good confession, if you will, to these two spies. In fact, in addition to that, and I read this earlier in verse 9, she had told them, she said, I know that the Lord has given you this land. It, the reason she knew that was because of this, because she knew that the God they served was the God of heaven and earth. And so that caused her to draw no other conclusion than to think, I know your God has given you this land. I know that is true. I want you to consider what we're seeing with this prostitute, Rahab. She had heard about what God had done, and she responds in faith. At this point, she hadn't yet experienced any of it herself. She didn't have any firsthand knowledge of the God of Israel, of his power and might and holiness. She had no firsthand experience of any of that. She had only heard the reports, yet she recognized the truth, and she embraced it. Now, I want you to think about the, the thought here of Rahab and what was going on in her mind and in her heart. You see, in contrast, how often do we want God to act first and then we'll trust him? You know, sometimes our attitudes and, and, and our self-talk that's going on in our mind and in our prayers, I mean, it actually gets incorporated in our prayers sometimes, are, are things like this. Okay, God, if you'll just do this and do that for me, if you'll just work out this situation for me, then I'll trust you and I'll recognize you for who you are and I'll live for you. How often is that the angle, the, the thought pattern we have? God, as long as, 
as long as you give me a sign, as long as you do this and, and demonstrate yourself in this way, then I will trust you. Friends, that's not trust. That is not faith. Faith is saying, okay, God, I don't know exactly what's going to happen next, but I leave that up to you because I know who you are. That's faith. And that's where Rahab was living her life at this moment in time. What kind of a future does someone with a tarnished past like this really have? I mean, she was used goods. She had a reputation that preceded her in that whole area. So the question is a legitimate question. What kind of a future does someone with a tarnished past like this really have? This is where it gets good. Because you turn into the New Testament and you get the answers. James chapter 2, and I can't fit it all on the screen, so I'll break it into two parts. James chapter 2, starting with verses 23 and 24, says this. So the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And that's the whole case that James is building in this portion of his, his short letter is that you know faith alone is hollow faith. But it's in our action that f true faith is truly demonstrated. It's in our actions, in our obedience. And that's the point that he's making. So he says, he says, Abraham believed God, and that's why he was considered a righteous man, and that's why he was considered to be a friend of God. Okay, Abraham, the father of the faith. That wasn't any new news to any Jewish person, because they knew that based on the old, the, the old stories back in, in what we consider our Old Testament. But here's what I want you to notice, because James isn't done yet. In the same breath, James, right after talking about Abraham, he, he continues on and says this, in the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. What James is saying is that consider Abraham. He's an example for us. He's a man that was a righteous man in the eyes of God. He's a man that was the friend of God. In the same way, Rahab. In the same way, Rahab was righteous. Rahab was a friend of God. What kind of future does someone with a tarnished past really have? We've gone a long way in answering that just by looking at James 2, but we're not done. You look in Hebrews chapter 11, and that's considered the, the faith hall of fame. All these notable men and women of the faith back in the pages of the Old Testament, they're listed out there and how they had lived lives of faith, including Abraham, but there's a ton more that are listed there. And by the time you get to verse 31, guess what you read? Whose name you read? you read about a woman named Rahab, included in the faith chapter. She's in the company of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, these guys. She's in the company of these incredible prophets like Elijah and, and Moses. and these. He, she, she's in the company of kings like David that are listed out in that chapter. And even in that chapter, you read of Rahab. We're still not done. You look in the first book of the New Testament, the first chapter of the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, and you read this. Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered King David. Now this is all a part of the genealogy that's listed out in the first chapter of Matthew. In fact, for those of you that have read through the Bible, you know how tempting it is when you get to Matthew chapter 1 to fly through that passage because it's just a bunch of listings of names of who begat who and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and you just kind of fly through it. And in so doing, you miss some really powerful messages. And that's what I'm trying to draw attention to here. What this passage that's on the screen right now, 
that verse and a half, what that is communicating is that this Rahab, this, this previous prostitute, that Rahab ended up being the great, great grandmother of David. She became a part of David's family line. But that's not even the purpose of Matthew chapter 1. It's not talking about David's genealogy. It's talking about someone else's genealogy. And when you back up a step and you look at, at all the verses of Matthew 1, you realize that Rahab became the great, 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 and I've totally lost track, but put about 30 greats in there, literally. 30 greats. She became the great, great grandmother of Jesus our Lord. Wow. And you think about where she came from. You think about her past. What is the message that comes through regarding this mini story of Rahab? The message is this, at least that I get. It doesn't matter how much baggage you've got. It doesn't matter how tarnished your past is. It doesn't matter how sinful your sin has been. God's grace is sufficient. You may walk in these doors today and you're just like all the other times you've ever walked in these doors and you just don't feel worthy. Man, I don't have any right to be around a church or to be in the company of God's people because of the things in my past. The message for you that comes from this mini story, among others in the Bible, is that God's grace is sufficient. And that ought to put a smile on your face. That ought to put a smile on each one of our faces because we've all got some skeletons in the closet. We've all got some things from our past that we're ashamed of. There's one more mini story I want to touch on before we close out, and that is the apostles. You know, when I think about the apostles, and this particular one is one that has resonated with me for, uh, resonated with me for, for you know, years and years and years. It's, it's who they were, you know, Peter, James, John, Matthew, Bartholomew, Thomas, you know, all these guys. There, there is a verse in the New Testament that I think just really hits the nail on the head in helping us to appreciate who these guys were. It's in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Some of the apostles had been arrested. This is after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And they've been arrested because the religious leaders are irritated because they keep talking about Jesus. And so they bring them before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, and they're basically telling them, shut your mouths or we'll shut them for you. They threaten them. And it's in the middle of that setting that Peter and John talk. And this is, this is the verse that records the reaction. It says, when they, the Sanhedrin, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. There's the phrase, unschooled, ordinary men. I don't know where I read this, but uh, um, I read this statement I'm getting ready to quote for you. Uh, I read it some time ago, and it's always stuck with me. Uh, and, and it serves, it serves as a good summation of the apostles. It goes like this. The most remarkable thing about the twelve is that they were so unremarkable. The most remarkable thing about the twelve is that they were so unremarkable. When Jesus chose the twelve, not a one of them was a rabbi. Not a one of them was a scribe or a teacher of the law. Not one was a Pharisee or a Sadducee. Not one of them was a priest. They were perfectly normal in every way. None of them were philosophers. There was not in their midst a great orator. There was no scholars in their company. They were Galileans. Galileans were considered low-class, rural people, uneducated people. Galileans were considered to be among the most average 
working class people around. That's what a Galilean was. If you go and visit some of the great cathedrals in Europe, and I have as of yet to do that, but based on pictures I've seen and things that I've read, if you go and visit the great cathedrals in Europe, you might assume the apostles were larger than life saints with impressive halos over their heads all the time. You might think that they were some type of spiritual giants, super saints. But that's just not it. They didn't spend any of their time on a pedestal. That wasn't where they lived their lives. And they were not like Roman gods of some type, though they sometimes today are portrayed that way. Even Jesus remarked on one occasion about the way they were. And this was after he had spent three years with them. He said to the 11 that remained, because Judas is, is no more, he, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Basically, what Jesus was remarking on was how they were such slow learners and somewhat spiritually dense. <laughs> so, what's the message that we get from the apostles? The mini story within the greater story line of the Bible. The message that I walk away with is this. That's who I am. They weren't so different than me. I'm just an average guy. I don't have any special prestige or influence, and I certainly don't have any exceptional talents of any type. I'm just an average guy. And all of a sudden, it causes me to realize that it's on that basis I qualify to be able to be used by God, just like the other apostles were. You see, there's a message there, and it's an important message. Let me end with this last slide. Why this title for this message? The title, Unlikely. Well, it's because of this. At face value, most of these storylines didn't seem to have a chance. But perception is very different from reality when God is a part of the picture. You think about Rahab and you think about all the baggage that she had because of the lifestyle that she was living. Or you think of the apostles and, and their thick-headed, stubborn, you know, who's the greatest sort of self-centered ways that they were. And, and you think about that and boy, you don't see a real positive outcome on that. You think you think about the thief on the cross who had lived a life apart from, from God's will his entire life until the last minute. You see, you look at each one of these storylines, and they all look very unlikely that they're going to turn out well. But yet, that's looking at them in a natural way. But when you include God in the picture, it totally changes the story, as it does for you and I. Our ushers are going to get up at this time and be preparing for our time of communion. And I got one last thought, one last challenge to give you based on what we've looked at today. These all represent, these six stories, as I've already stated, they all represent many stories within the greater story of the Bible. The greater story of the Bible is what? God loves you. The whole plan of redemption, of sending Jesus to die on the cross and to be raised back to life on the third day, freeing you from your sin so you can have an eternal relationship with God. That's the storyline of the Bible, and that's why we take communion every week, to keep that fresh in our minds so we never forget that. And rightly so, it needs to be fresh in our minds. But today we've been reminded of some of these mini stories that make up bits and pieces of the greater story. And here's the challenge I want to give you, is that if you do not discipline yourself to spend time reading in the Bible, if all you ever do is the Sunday morning thing, as far as your spiritual journey is concerned, and as far as Bible exposure goes, if it's just limited to Sunday morning, you are missing out of the blessing and the benefit that these mini stories can have in your day-to-day -day life because that's where they really make an impact in your life. Because you're just like me. You have ups and you have downs. 
you have discouragement, whether it be job-related or it be health-related or, or it be some kind of personal relationship-related. You, 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 you've got some bad days that are going to come. We all do. But it's in the middle of that context that these mini stories breathe life and help to remind us we're never alone. The odds are never totally against us when God's in the equation. You see, there's a blessing found in that, but it's a blessing that you and I forfeit if we don't stick our nose in the book. That's why we need to be people of the book. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful. We're thankful for the salvation that we have been blessed with because of your love and your grace. We don't deserve what you have done on our behalf, but we celebrate it, and rightly so. We celebrate it both now and forever. We'll be singing your praises for all eternity. But this morning we've been reminded of, of the little blessings that come from the many stories within your word. They're sweet to the taste. They're more precious than gold because they breathe life into our lives. They put a skip back into our step. They help pick our chin up when our chin is down. They help us to have courage when we're discouraged. Father, thank you for your word and how it's living and active. And it represents a continual blessing for each one of us.